Dr. Foa, I will ask you in retrospect, with a life of experience on two continents, on the European continent and the American continent. You have experienced, well, certainly discrimination in Italy uh, during the fascist regime. You have lived in the United States for many years. You probably were more aware of the Jewish community in the United States than you were in Italy. As a consequence of that experience of yours, <clears throat> what do you think? Is there a future for the Jewish community in Italy? Can I go back a little bit before I answer your question? Uh, you said that I have experienced anti-Semitism in Italy. Uh, that has to be, that statement has to be modified. I have experienced legal, official anti-Semitism, never personal anti-Semitism. And this is very important for the following statement. Uh, when I came to this country and I had, uh, I was obviously welcomed, embraced, given all the opportunities by the Jewish community. Uh, they were two uh, very influential Gentile persons who made life easier for me. One was no less than Harvey Cushing, the father of neurosurgery, professor of neurosurgery at Harvard. One, uh, another one was uh, uh, Walter B. Cannon, uh, also professor of physiology at, at Harvard, who, uh, however, uh, did their good works through Jacob Fine. They didn't personally do anything. They introduced me, they said that they knew who my father was, who I was, et cetera, et cetera, and Jacob Fine took over. So that my American experience, anything that happened to me in the United States, uh, was by and large the result of having been incorporated, adopted, if you will, by the Jewish community. However, I have a very interesting experience. When I arrived, after having been in the East for three or four months, I got a job at the University of Michigan. And uh, I was a research fellow in Ann Arbor. And I had to go to a, a Congress in New York. So I did. And I decided to drive. I had just bought an old uh, second-hand car. And I decided that on the way back, I'd take a couple of days uh, off and drive through the Catskills just to see the, the beautiful scenery. And as I was driving along, I saw signs that were strange to me. Restri restricted clientele or signs to that effect. And I couldn't make any sense out of them. I, uh, I figured that Maybe uh, you've got to have money to go in there or something. I it just couldn't make any sense. Then something funny happened. I, I was stopped by the police for speeding. And uh, I had to pay $15 fine on the spot. Uh, that left me without enough money to buy the gas to come back. So I didn't know whether to go back to New York or take my chances. Uh, and at, just at that time, I see a big sign that said, Grossinger's, excellent cuisine. So I said, fine, it's just lunchtime. Let's see if I can convince uh, somebody there to give me, uh, to cash a check. The coincidence uh, have it that as I was talking to the, to the person trying to con him into giving me some cash, who was there but the secretary of the Committee for the Resettlement of Jewish Scientists, whom I had met and had taken care of me in New York. That, of course, settled the economic question. She countersigned my check, and I was in business. So I had enough money to buy lunch. I also had enough money to, uh, enough time to talk to this gal and ask her, what on earth does this mean? 
So she explained to me what it meant. So here I suddenly realized that I had left a country where there was no popular anti-Semitism, there was state anti-Semitism, and I came to a country where there was exactly the opposite. And this was a shocking experience. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do you, as a consequence of your experience, think that there is a unique feature to the Jewish community or to the Jew unlike what you have experienced in Italy or even in the United States? I don't understand the question. But what I mean is <clears throat> you have experienced maybe not anti-Semitism, you have experienced discrimination certainly in uh, governmental discrimination in Italy. Yes. I was officially have, kicked out. Yeah. You have also experienced some friendship, your personal friend and your father's friend who cut off all the relationship with him as a consequence of the fascist new law. Fear or whatever it was. What I want to ask you is, <clears throat> did all of these experience, experiences make you, I wouldn't say more proud, but more Jewish conscious, or didn't it have any effect upon you at, uh, whatsoever? Oh, no, there's no question about it, yes. The answer to the question is yes. Uh, the, um, I don't know exactly what the reasons are, uh, first of all, well, the first reason, the obvious reason, is the fact that I have become aware of Jewish tradition and Jewish culture, uh, uh, which is uh, essentially news to me. Uh, the, um, the fact that we had uh, a, a cache of, of family memorabilia that go back to, to be a fall of 1550, uh, was uh, was never uh, had never reached the the threshold of my awareness. Uh, these are things that were knocking around family drawers. Nobody paid much attention to it. So that the experience, uh, undoubtedly, uh, uh, the the Italian experience, a primarily American experience, uh, made me aware of, of the fact, uh, like it or not. Uh, the majority of my friends in the United States are not Gentile. There, there are uh, there are two categories: you know, the academic world and, and the and the social world. And the social world is primarily Jewish, so that you can't help uh, becoming aware of, of of the tradition and culture, etc., which is a new experience. Another one is, I suppose, uh, personal ordinariness, if you. If you kick me in the teeth, by golly, I, because I'm Jewish, then I'm more Jewish than I was before. Uh, yeah. To the they, best of your they, knowledge, they, did your father ever, during his lifetime, become more Jewish conscious than he was before the war? My, uh, I hate to say this, but my, my father, had uh, some resentment about his Jewishness. There is one story that he has repeated to me n number of times, and he repeated it to my wife any number of times. And I've been trying to get to the origin of it, and I wish you could help me find it. But it is the story of when, of how, when he was in grade school, a young child, some of the fellows in the, in the school would go after him, uh, taking the end of the coat, the jacket, gathering it up this way, and making what was a pig's ear. This is uh, the, the facsimile of a pig's ear. And they would go 
waving this thing at him, saying, yeah, 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 Jew boy, in, uh, in Piedmontese um, dialect, which is, Uriad Kring, Uriad Azu, Tutie Brau, Ebreut Piazu, which rhymes and translated and means pig's ears, ass ears, ass's ears, uh, all Jews like you, or, or something to that effect. I have looked at every conceivable book on Jewish and anti-Semitic iconography, uh, and I can't find this thing. But it was traumatizing enough to my father that he uh, repeated this to me and repeated it to her. Mm -hmm. This was a very traumatizing experience. He, he repeated this thing to, until he was 90. And, uh, and uh, it created a, uh, a sort of resentment about his Jewishness that uh, mm -hmm. a, a sharp contrast with the, the same old story. The person who feels totally uh, identified uh, with a group and finds that some of the people in the group kick you in the teeth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because this is the experience of the German Jews, as you know. Uh, the biggest shock of the German Jews was the fact that they always considered themselves quote unquote German. German. Very much so. In fact, the German Jew was proud of saying his first German and then okay, but I, I, I think that there is a difference, and it brings me back to what we were saying before. Uh, the uh, the difference between uh, the, the the meaning of the word assimilation. Assimilation, if you look it up in the dictionary, means that you become you identified with uh, yourself with whatever. The rest of the so the minority uh, uh, assimilates into the majority. The Italian Jews do not fit that description because it is, like I said before, they became Italian by the same process of acculturization that the Venetians or, 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 or the Neapolitans became. And my favorite comparison is, is to say to take five um, um, acorns and put them all together and pretty soon they all fuse and they make one trunk. And, and this is not assimilation because it isn't as if the Jews were assimilating into an existing society. It is that all of these various groups they started out with an entirely different culture. There's no more relationship between the Piedmontese and the Neapolitans than there's between the Jews or anybody else. Now, the Italian Jews never considered themselves a need to be assimilated. They That's were assimilated right. to start. They were, they, are, they were part of the... Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if this applies to the Germans or not, but... Uh, <clears throat> all in all, the, you um, find yourself as a consequence of various experiences uh, more Jewish conscious than you did before. Do you think that the Jews have a unique contribution to make to society? Well, the answer is yes, but it's a big order. How do you answer that question? Uh, we, have, we have a, a unique contribution to make, like any culture has. Uh, in my uh, retirement, I have participated and I've taken on a number of auxiliary jobs. One is, right now, to be president of the Dante Alighieri Society, which is a 100-year-old uh, organization with uh, chapters all over the world, whose purpose is to promote Italian culture and language. and. Uh, I see it as an opportunity to bring uh, the best of the Italian culture to the Detroit community. Why doesn't that apply to, to the Jews or anybody else? I'm going to ask you a question that you may or may not know the answer, but you may have a feeling for it. 
would you say that the Jews in Italy were on the average had more formal education than the general public? Yes. Yes. The 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 average Jew, Italian Jew, <coughs> pre-war belonged to families that had been in Italy for centuries, sometimes millennia, whose uh, fate was varied. Their fortunes varied depending on what state in, in Italy they were. But by and large, uh, except in the excesses of the Crusades and other periods, they had opportunities that possibly other Jews did not have uh, steady. So that they had achieved a degree of, of uh, economic well-being and cultural well-being. I don't know. Any, I never met a, a, an illiterate Jew in Italy. The reason that I'm asking you that, because this was true all over Europe, even in Eastern Europe, the sure. education of the Jew was... Why do you describe to that? Why do I describe it? How do you... What do you ascribe to oh. that phenomenon? I can only uh, quote my father-in-law, or not, but describe his attitude. He was born in a little town, which we thought was a joke, until we discovered that it's in, in, in one of the books in your library. Yakimovich is described in a little book that you have as a 2,000 or 2,300 inhabitants or some ridiculous thing. And he was always making jokes to the point that <laughs> I wasn't quite sure whether Kimuchi existed or not. But he also was telling the story of how he would go to, 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 the, uh, to the shul uh, on his bare feet, carrying his shoes on his shoulder, because when he got there, he had to put the shoes on, but he didn't want to wear them down walking. And he always described his veneration, perhaps is the wrong word, but I think it's not for knowledge. And uh, his, his schooling was entirely uh, uh, provided by the Hebrew schools. But uh, when he retired, his big joy was to go back to the thing and read the, the texts. After all, what's in the, uh, what's in the uh, temple? The book? Right. Well, that's what I'm trying to uh, find out. Now, from a person like you, who was raised in a family that did not have what you would call a Jewish consciousness, yet, what, how would a family like that explain why the same Italians are, are on the average, less formally educated than the Jews are, uh, less literate, how would you also explain, or would you explain, or would you agree with that, that in Italy, for example, Jews were less physical violent than non-Jews? Is that, would you say that this was true in Italy? Oh, I presume so. I, I have never heard of, of uh, Jews jailed for, for murder or for violence. I've never heard of such a thing. The other question, I don't know that's a fair one. The, uh, the Jews had achieved a, a level of, uh, of, in society, which was equivalent to, say, the middle to upper middle class. And within that group, there was no great difference. Uh, the, uh, what the, the, uh, the, the Jews who believed in the Jewish tradition may have been that motivation, but the equivalent Italian groups were strongly motivated by the uh, tradition of the classical culture. We all went to the classical uh, curriculum. I had eight years of Latin, five years of Greek before I, I got to the university. And this was the type of education that the, the equivalent society, uh, the reason why if you say the average uh, level of education was lower, it was purely economical. The peasants uh, went to uh, went to school for five years well, because that was compulsory. This in Italy, although I doubt whether the poor Jews in Italy were illiterate. Yeah, but there were very few. I never known a poor Jew. In oh, you never. Well, you may have not been in contact, but I'm sure there were. There must have been. There were some. 
small shopkeepers in, in Rome and other places, but the, the average do had no problem going to school. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, don't forget that school was free. Yeah, including the university. Tuition is a ridiculous thing, even to this day. Uh -huh. I paid the equivalent of fifty dollars a year to go to medical school. I see. Yeah, yeah. but this was not true in Eastern Europe. No, of course not. And there were a lot of poor people in Eastern, in Eastern Europe, but nevertheless, they were well, very rarely illiterate. One early experience with antisemitism was uh, when during the Ethiopian campaign, when Italy was hit with the economic sanctions and we were going through the motions of saving energy, saving this, saving that. Uh, it was, ad we adopted, many of us adopted the uh, continuous day. And we didn't go home for lunch, so that we didn't have double traffic. So we had lunch, and we had lunch in the laboratory, and we had a big room, where we did our experiments, and we, we, we brown bagged it. And there were two Romanian Jews at the time, Clara Torda, and Leona Roitzen, Leo Roitzen, they came and they both did very well in the United States. He became professor of pathology at Columbia, and she was also somewhere there. And I still remember these two guys telling us of that we were talking about. They were in medical school at the time. And we asked him, well, how the hell do you come here? Why, why did you come to Milano and then go to school in, in, in Romania? Numerous clauses. Well, we all were schooled in Latin, and we knew what the words meant, but we had no idea what, what the thing meant. What the hell numerous clauses? What's numerous clauses? We wouldn't believe it. We thought it was the damnedest piece of nonsense we ever heard. It exists in the United States, too, as you know. Oh, I can go on with that. I had personal experience. Thank with the strange thing, it was a Jewish man that um, who was the head of the AMA at the time, who uh, subscribed to it. I was a research fellow at the University of Michigan, as I told you. My wife, Naomi, was at the time a graduate student in biochemistry. So that I used to go to the seminars in biochemistry because I'm interested in this discipline and because she had to go. And over the years, I got to know H.B. Lewis, professor of biochemistry at the University of Michigan, who was also the chairman of the admission committee and was also the uh, chairman of a one-man uh, bureau for, for finding jobs for young scientists. And the Bnei Brith came to Ann Arbor, the committee, and they wanted to uh, find out the official policies of the professional schools, not for purposes of, of uh, putting pressure, of, uh, but simply for uh, counseling purposes. Tell the kids what the, uh, and they were looking at the law school, the medical school, and they wanted to know nursing, whatever. They wanted to know uh, what was the official policy of the medical school. And uh, when I told them about it, I said, I, you want to ask him? I said, of course. I, and I went to ask to Lewis. And he just said, oh, of course we have a policy, 6% in the medical school. And I said, well, why, why did you pick that number? So he gave me a long, very rational explanation of the relative number of Jews in the American population, and that this was a very generous thing because it was, in fact, double or whatever, and on and on. Uh, whereupon I uh, I was beginning to seethe a little bit, and I asked him, what is the percentage, the quota for Germans? Uh, of course, he didn't have the answer. And that ended the conversation and my friendship with H.B. Lewis. But, so, there you go. <laughs> well, Dr. Paul, we are, I want to thank you very much for the interview. We are going to look over this interview and I'm going to see whether there are some areas there that we would like to uh, elaborate on. And if we do, I hope that you will be available for further uh, interviews. I will be happy. And as I said before, I have written most of this down. 
you have a copy of my manuscript. Uh, use it as you see fit. Uh, use it as a starting point for other questions if you wish. Okay. And it contains uh, approximately 280 references to documents and material, which you're welcome to examine. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, uh, really a pleasure.